Welcome to the Growth Enablement Madness Podcast, and I'm Jim Ward, your host, CEO of BrainCell, the growth enablement company. I'm absolutely mad about helping businesses grow and scale. And in this podcast, my team and I get a chance to talk shop with industry thought leaders about a variety of growth enablement strategies, stories, and technology trends. I'm happy that you're here, so let's get the growth conversation started. Hello, everybody. This is Jim Ward. I'm president of the Brain Cell. We're a growth enablement company, and we're ba- happy to be back uh, on this podcast. And uh, we've got a fantastic guest with us today. Uh, his name is Richard Perez, and he's with Apex Partners, private equity firm. Hey, Richard, how are you? Hey, Jim. I'm doing very well. Doing very well. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's, I've been I've been looking forward to this. Uh, and of course, we've worked together, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, working on projects. So uh, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background, Richard, so the folks know a little bit about who you are, where you've come from? Sure. Um, Personal background. I am uh, a native Texan, grew up in uh, a pretty rural part of Texas outside of Amarillo, uh, Texas. So if if you know that town, then you know it's a a pretty remote part of the world, but great people, friendly folks, Um, and went to a small university there in the Texas Panhandle um, at one point was thinking about getting into politics and I'm very, very glad that, uh, <laughs> I didn't. Um, and I ended up joining a firm called the corporate executive board mm-hmm. probably 22 years ago, which was a high growth research consulting, uh, company that um, shared best practices with, uh, various functional executives. So CFOs, heads of strategy, heads of sales and marketing and on down the line, where we were growing rapidly at one point, I think 25% quarter over quarter. So just crazy growth. Uh, And it's really where I cut my teeth in sales. And that is my background. I've been in sales for the better part of 25 years, did a little bit of work before joining the corporate executive board in sales. But that was really where I cut my teeth and learned how to be um, a salesperson, how to be a sales manager, and eventually a sales leader. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, use that to join a couple of um, startups, uh, none which uh, were super successful, and then became an independent sales consultant advising various businesses over years on sales and go-to-market strategy, sales and go-to-market operations. Uh, and eventually I landed at the Apex doorstep um, a few years ago and have been working with them for about two and a half years. Well, that, that leads me to my next question. But before I ask my next question, I'm starting to get really jealous of that voice you have. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're going to put me out of business. I um, I, I, I like to say, Jim, I've, I've got a, a pretty decent voice, I've got, but I've got a face for, for radio. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. Richard, um, do you have a podcast? I do not. I do uh, not. You should, you, you should consider it. It's a, uh, yeah. It's I'll, sultry I'll take, take any suggestions you guys have for sure. And actually <laughs> that, that voice would go well with, well with politics. Uh, it's strong. And uh, so maybe you just get votes, votes in the voice. Um, but how, you know, so how, what attracted you to private equity? What, what landed you on that doorstep? Well, um, so short answer is a, a, a good friend and colleague of mine named Jamie Fuller, who I worked with at CEB uh, many, many years ago, Um, and boy, if you ever want to know what a highly successful, really competent and capable salesperson is, go look her up and talk to her. Um, she was, uh, doing a similar role to what I am doing now. And she pulled me in when I was an independent consultant to support her because she had a lot of demand from the portfolio, uh, for sales and go to market work. And so I came in and started supporting some of our portfolio companies, um, and several months into it, she reached out and said, hey, I'm actually leaving this role. Mm-hmm. I'm going inside the portfolio to lead a sales team for one of our report codes. And I think they're going to talk to you about um, doing this full time. Mm-hmm. And they did. And I, I spoke with uh, Seth Brody, who leads uh, our operating group, which we call the Operational Excellence Practice, the OEP. And um, it was an easy decision to join this group. Um, first of all, the team that Seth has built is full of really, really competent people. There, I think there are 28 of us. All of us are former operators who've been in seat doing the the work that we now um, support the portfolio on. Um, And every one of them, we have to go through this pretty detailed assessment to to join the OEP. And, And the common thread among all of us is that we are all hardwired to want to make a difference, to want to have an impact Right. And that's the kind of team that I want to be on. And I, I discovered that pretty early on. And so it was an easy decision to say yes to that group. 
it was an easy decision to say yes to um, APAX because I learned that the deal teams are highly collaborative and they want to work with the OEP. Yeah. Uh, and then when when I think about the overall firm, the firm has a set of core values. I think it's four values that that the firm focuses on, but there were two in particular that really resonated with me. One is that we choose right over easy, and two is that we believe in learn, learning, adapting, and growing. And both of those are central to my own uh, personal values. So when I learned that about Apex, it was a pretty easy decision to to join an incredible team with highly competent and capable deal teams and core values that that really resonated with me. And that's a good reason for joining, uh, because uh, uh, and, and plus the uh, the noble purpose of actually really helping. I think that's very important. That's our uh, that's our uh, core as well. It's a core a value of ours. Um, and, and tell me a little bit about the role you play then uh, at Apex Partners. Yeah. So I lead our sales and go to market practice. We have different practice areas within um, our, our within the OEP, uh, but I lead our sales and go to market practice. And I use that twenty five years of experience that I have to to really um, help in in what I would call pre deal and post deal work. The pre deal is. The deal teams will often pull us in when they are evaluating an asset that they are um, rec- thinking about recommending that the the Apex funds invest in. Mm-hmm. And I get involved to assess the sales and go-to-market capabilities of those organizations to see, um, are there significant risks that we should think about? Is this a good to great story? Um, and if, if we are going to try and make it great, what are the investments that we're going to need from a people, process, and technology perspective mm-hmm. to ensure that we can grow and scale those organizations? And then that's the second part of what I do is I get involved in the value creation post deal. So we look for ways to um, capitalize on the the um, deal thesis that our deal teams have and ensure that we're driving the growth that we we want to see and that the the founders or the leaders of the, those organizations that we're investing in want to see. Our deal teams are exceptional at finding really great assets who are doing really well and growing, but we think we can grow even faster. And so I get involved in in supporting that. And I've got an individual on my team, uh, Chloe, who is a RevOps expert who helps with a lot of uh, that value creation work on the sales operations or revenue operations side. Um, so that's what we do is look at uh, everything from strategy to operations to technology and process to go try and, and, and deliver that value creation work that we, uh, or that value creation that we all want to achieve. So, you know, we're very much aligned with that uh, growth and scale, which is why we call ourselves a growth enablement company. Um, your perspective uh, as an investor, so to speak, not you personally as the investor, but the uh, the partnership group um, has the same, it sounds like, uh, with helping the investment and the companies grow. Um, what, do you, what do you and Apex focus on in terms of helping newly acquired companies grow and scale? What is your focus? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to speak on behalf of the deal teams, mostly because they all look at, at different things, and and really we sort of leave the, you know, what is it that um, Apex focuses on to our communications team. So I'll, I'll defer to them. I can tell you what I look at uh, when the deal teams bring me in. Um, we often will will look for that good to great story uh, that okay. we want to create, right? And and so. Um, when I get involved in doing um, due diligence with our deal teams, I will want to understand, do we have a clear go-to-market strategy? So at the okay. very sort of top of things, are we clear-eyed about where we're taking the organization, uh, where we can grow? Um, does the data support that? In other words, do they have a track record that suggests that go-to-market strategy is working and that they can build on that? Number two... Do they have a clear ICP, ideal client profile? Do they know the customers that are going to give them the greatest long-term value? They're going to give them the greatest or the highest ACV, best conversion rate uh, or win rate, um, and the, the, the best chance to, 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 to grow, right? And so mm-hmm. oftentimes this is a place where sales organizations don't spend enough time is defining their ICP. Right. And you can waste a lot of sales reps' efforts by focusing on the wrong people. So I often look to see, are they really clear about that? And then three, do they have a real clear value proposition? Do they understand what the impact can be of their product or service that they have developed on the potential customers that they want to go after? And that's oftentimes a place where organizations struggle. They understand sort of the, what I'll call the features and benefits of their product or service, but they may not understand how it's actually impacting customers 
Um, so that's sort of the the table stakes of what we look at when we're first going into those conversations. But then you get into things like, do they have the right sales process, the right sales methodology? Do they have the right accountability structure, KPIs and reporting to give that transparency that you can have that accountability? Do they have the right technology stack uh, in place to drive the efficiency and effectiveness of the sales force? So there are several things that we look at. And then when we come out of diligence, we say, well, there are the three, here are the three or four things they're really good at. But to get that good to great story, here are the five things that we need to go focus on to enable the growth and scalability that we all think we can get to. That's really great information. And for the listeners out there, um, uh, all of that is applicable to even folks who are not being invested in or uh, all of those are very important parts of looking at your own company. And um, looking at make sure you have your your ICP clear, um, very important. And you know, you mentioned uh, people, process, and technology. It's something we talk about a lot as well. Um, as you know, we do something called blueprinting here, which uh, focuses a lot first on that people and process um, before technology. Sometimes, and can you talk to that a little bit? Do you do the same? Is that um, align with your thinking? Very much so. So my general philosophy is that technology is an enabler for growth, right? It, it does not actually f- necessarily fuel growth. Right. If you don't have the right people, well, let's we'll just start at the top. If you don't have the right strategy um, and you don't know where you're taking the organization, you don't know who you're going after, you're, again, your ICP, you don't have the right people to execute on that, i.e. Mm-hmm. go into those potential customers and sell them effectively. They haven't been trained effectively. You don't have a good enablement in place. Um, you don't have the right process in place to go after the right opportunities and manage them through the pipeline. If all those things aren't in place, technology is not going to do much for you. And so I, I fundamentally believe you have to have the right strategy and people uh, and process in place before technology is ever going to make a difference. And we see this, um, you know, we've, we've seen it several times inside of our portfolio companies where we've made investments either pre-deal or sometimes post-deal in technology that really isn't getting things done. And then I, I will work with the with the head of sales or the CRO to spot why that's happening and then work with them on the people, the process, uh, the accountability to make sure that we get those things right in order to extract the value of those technology investments that, that uh, we're making. Always music to my ears because having done this for now almost 30 years and seeing a number of failures in the marketplace where people thought the technology was the savior. Um, it's simply not. It's uh, it's an enabler, and uh, you really yeah. understand. Yeah, we we had a we had a business that was you know their head of sales was really eager to to buy a technology platform, a name that that we all know well. They're one of the eight hundred pound gorillas in the mm-hmm. sales tech space. And what I said to, to him and his CEO is, we don't have the right process in place to capitalize on that. You are not using your CRM. Yeah, and the capabilities of your CRM are not optimized, and it's not going to talk very well to that new investment that you want to make, and so you will not get the value out of it. And sometimes you just have to educate them on the the idea that there are things you need to do before you'll ever extract the value of those tech investments. Right. And it's nine times out of ten, if not ten times out of ten, they're very receptive to hearing that. Mm-hmm. And, and you may know this, Jim, but but worth sharing is we operate on a pull based model here at Apex, which is to say, we don't impose a, a playbook or a rule book or even a require them to make certain investments in technology, or we don't tell them they have to go with Salesforce versus HubSpot or or Gainsight versus something else. Right, um, it's up to them, uh, but we support them in helping them make those decisions, and we've got uh, partnerships with several of those tech vendors. Um, to try and get us the best deal possible, but also to ensure that we're getting the best value we can out of those. Uh, but it's really up to them and they will come to us at the OEP for advice when when they think they need it. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned um, the tech stacks, et cetera. Uh, where does uh, data come in uh, from your perspective for these companies? Um, you know, do you talk to them about analytics, for example, and data plumbing and all of that? We do, but there are people far smarter uh, than I on the OEP who will have those conversations. I mean, look, in sales, that is that is paramount to get right in order for you to grow and scale. If you don't have good data, if a sales team's not capturing data in the way that they're supposed to, you will never know where you are in the buying journey with your prospective customer, right? Um, 
And, and so you have to build that accountability in place with your sales team to make sure that you're capturing the right data throughout the sales process. Mm-hmm. And there's some great um, technology solutions out there that help make that easier for the sales team for sure. But you have to build the expectation that that uh, that that needs to happen. Um, having said that, I don't have to tell you the business you're in. You know, you know better than I. Data comes in many different formats and many, from many different places, and so. Mm-hmm. My visibility is in the sales and go-to-market space and what the sales team captures, what the customer success team captures about prospects or customers. Uh, But there's a lot more data out there that, um, again, people far smarter than I will focus on to say, do we have the best capabilities to capture that data, to Mm -hmm. understand that data, to interpret that data? Um, And uh, they will get involved to help understand whether or not their data is optimized, whether or not their data is captured in the right structure in the with the right tools, and then how do you pull those different sources of data together um, to ensure that you've got the right visibility into the health of the business and the health of your customer base, and right. uh, whether or not you you are are going to look at a good year from a renewal uh, perspective or not. Right. Um, so we rely on those people again on the OEP who who are far smarter than I am to. To, to make sure that we are we are in a good position when it comes to data and that we have the right uh, solutions in place to enable our growth. Well, it's all about mastery, right? So um, you're, you have your mastery and the OEP guys are mastery uh, at their data concepts. Um, uh, but you know, I, I, this is a little bit of a left turn. Um, sure. have, you, have you had any experience with uh, artificial intelligence today? I know you, you love technology. It appears to me you do. And you have a lot of relationships with uh, vendors. And um, have you had any experience with some artificial intelligence uh, technologies that have been effective? Um, me personally, um, no. Um, in 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 that I haven't sort of been deeply involved in working with AI businesses when I was leading sales organizations. That said, we have a fantastic AI company called Faculty. Um, you can look them up, faculty.ai, which is an exceptional business who has done really great work. And as, as they would tell you, look, AI has a, a thousand different definitions and, and probably a lot more than that. Um, and they've got a great story about the impact that they had um, on the the UK during COVID and were instrumental in helping inform decisions that the UK government was making about um, COVID policy. You can go to their website and get the story there. And and, um, they probably saved, most certainly saved a lot of lives in the UK with um, their AI capabilities and some of the decisions that they enabled. Um, But they use those capabilities for many, many different business purposes and and processes and decisions, whether it's supply chain intelligence or customer intelligence. Um, so that that is um, that is a, an exceptional organization in our portfolio and, and it is probably where I'm learning the most about AI is through that team. I'll take a look at that. And by the way, I want to let, let folks know that um, if you want to take a look at uh, uh, the website of Apex, it's apex.com. I think that have that right, APAX.com. Mm-hmm. You, you can see, uh, I think, uh, the investments that are made there as well uh, and a lot of profiles. Uh, very interesting. I want to look up faculty.ai. Uh, we have worked with some um, AI um, products and actually, you and I have never talked about it, so that's a conversation for another day. Sure. Um, but helps uh, companies scale. Um, another conversation. But um, okay, um, so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, building growth with sustainability. It's kind of an overlooked part of building growth. Um, how do you create sustainable growth within your uh, the companies that you're working with? Well, you know, not to be redundant, Jim, but I mean, it does start with a lot of the foundational things that I talked yeah. about earlier, right, is in order to to build um, really sustainable growth, that foundation of the commercial organization and certainly the broader business needs to be in place from from a commercial organization is it, it is that the, the building blocks from my perspective are do we have the right strategy and is that mm-hmm. strategy informed uh, by data and information that tells us where we have the best chance to win? Do we have a strong ICP as the second building block? Do we have a strong value message or value proposition and message around that? Do we have the right people in seat? And are we you know, developing those people to be as successful as possible, as quickly as possible in our onboarding and, and beyond? 
Do we have the right sales process in place? Do we have you know the right technology investments to allow us to 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 drive or maximize efficiency mm-hmm. and effectiveness of the sales organization? So those are some of the basic building blocks that that I think um, are important to to building and scaling uh, an organization. But I want to take a, a bit of a left turn myself. In in that um, there are things that I think commercial organizations need to do, particularly as we look at potential economic headwinds and I'm not yeah. economist and I'm not smart enough to to tell you where things are going to land but it's it's apparent to I think almost anyone who is paying attention that we are likely and may already be facing some economic headwinds that are challenging businesses and and um I suspect our our businesses are are, are no different uh, mm-hmm. though I, I wouldn't be able to speak to them um there are things that you have to do in in this environment as a as a sales leader to ensure that your team is prepared for what could be sort of choppy waters in front of us to, to mix my metaphors. Um, in, in so one that I've already spoken about twice, but it is worth mentioning again in, 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 in this context is you have to get your ICP right. right. If you're not really targeted, and even if you've done this exercise and you think you've got it right, it's worth doing again. The reason is, you you don't in in challenging economic headwinds um, you don't have the luxury of wasting time right and so I want my sales team focused on the best opportunities at every turn they should there should be no wasted effort in this environment and so doing one more turn of the crank on ICP to make sure that everybody that is in my territory as a sales rep is the kind of opportunity I should be pursuing. And, and so it's it's a little late in the year uh, now, but going into 2023, I, I if I'm a CRO, I would be turning the crank on this again. And I'm doing this with several of our businesses now. It is that important. And um, there, there are different ways to do- define ICP, which we could spend a lot of time right. on. And it's a different uh, podcast, but um, that's thing number one. Number two is uh, managers need to shift away from managing and shift to coaching in this environment. And I think that's true in general. But there's some colleagues of mine, um, I'm in Boulder uh, this week, but there's some colleagues of mine just down the road in Denver um, at an organization called Commercial Tribe, and they are focused on assessing how managers spend their time um, and are they allocating their time with the right people on their team, top performers versus middle of the pack versus new folks on their team, and are they doing the right things with their team? And this is a place that often gets overlooked by most sales organizations is they want to focus on process or technology mm. or you know, market and product uh, that they're selling. But they often overlook, and this is the thing that I think Commercial Tribe is really zeroing in on that's important, is you've got an asset that is your frontline managers. Are they being optimized? Are they are they spending their right time with the right people doing the right things? That's particularly critical in this environment. Number three, are you focusing on existing customers for growth? I can't recall if you and I have talked about this organization, but there's a there's a go to market consultancy and, and training organization that we work with from time to time called Winning by Design. Um, in Jocko, their founder uh, has a really great message. If you get a chance, go check out their website or go look at his LinkedIn posts. Uh, but he's got a great talk track on focusing on your existing customers. Why? Mm. They're the they're the people that know you best, and they are going to be the easiest, if you will to sell to. Right. And so the idea of getting revenue from the people that are going to give you the easiest path to that revenue starts with your existing customers. So um, you have to look at your current customer base and say, all right, what's our cross-sell ratio look like? What's our upsell uh, effectiveness look like with our existing customers? Can we you know, move from 1.8x um, or 1.8 uh, products purchased by existing customers to 2.5 or 3.2 or whatever it is. So relentlessly tracking what your opportunity is for cross sell with the, the people who know you best is critical. Boy. Number four, and this is another place that Winning by Design I think is really smart on or is really smart about is you got to focus on impact at every turn of that customer journey, and it starts with sales. Like. Challenger answered this question a long time ago when Challenger Sales was written, which is you have to focus on impact to the customer. Does our solution provide the, the right impact to the customer to move the needle? Otherwise, they're not likely to, 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 to make a buying decision, but it extends well into the, 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 the buying process. Once they become a customer, 
have you really zeroed in on what's the impact we're having day to day, week to week? Um, so those are four things that I think are really important. And a, not a not an insignificant fifth is: Do you have the right discount policy in place? When we are facing economic headwinds, or when we are uncertain about whether or not we're going to get to our number, sales teams start discounting like crazy, and that's mm-hmm. a mistake. And mm-hmm. so I'd encourage all CROs to make sure they've got a really tight handle on their discount policy. Otherwise, they're going to be giving away growth. Boy, that is great advice. I, folks, I hope you're listening closely. And if you can rewind and listen to that again, uh, spot on. This is, uh, though, when we change tracks a little bit, and we go to our tech tainment session, uh, we ask you a couple of questions that you really don't know the answers because we haven't told you. Um <laughs> So if you're ready, I'm going to ask uh, one of the questions, and I want to ask you, uh, and you're a very well-read guy, uh, what is your favorite business book and why? Ooh, uh, there, there are probably a few. Um, I think the one that I really like was written by the same guys who, who wrote Challenge. So I could talk about Challenge or Sale, um, and, and that certainly would be up there, but they wrote um, a, a sister book, if you will, a, a, mm-hmm. a compliment to that called Effortless Customer Experience. Mm. And I think they wrote that back in 2013, something like that. I, I don't know if you recall this, Jim, but at that time, there were a lot of organizations, consulting firms and the like, who were espousing this belief that you have to delight your customers, mm-hmm. uh, effectively suggesting that organizations go on offense, bend over backwards as much as possible to delight your customers. And the team that wrote Effortless Effortless Customer Experience did a lot of research and analysis to it, which allowed them to determine that delight actually doesn't transfer to loyalty uh, or translate to to loyalty. Um, Quite the contrary. Hmm. What customers are actually looking for is for you to deliver a service that is effortless. If you were calling into your bank because you can't get your answer, um, uh, your question answered through their website or through their chat bot, and you get passed around on uh, their call system two or three different times, you're going to be pretty frustrated with that bank and you're going to rethink your relationship there. Too many organizations have made it too hard to do work with them. And so effortless customer experience talks about the data that they have pulled together that shows the strongest correlation to loyalty is not to light, but effortless experience. And so it's a great book for all of us who are in the service-based industry to understand where the friction points in our organization when we're serving our customers. Everything from the sales process, is that effortful to get on a call with a salesperson and get questions answered to the time that we become customers? Is the contracting process difficult? Is the invoicing process and payment process difficult? Mm -hmm. Once I'm a customer, how hard is it for me to do business with you Do I have a challenge getting my questions answered? Are you taking too long to get me an answer? Or are the the, the answers or solutions unclear? Is the impact unclear? And so I really like that book and and often talk to it uh, about that book to customer success leaders. But it really is important for all of us, whether you're a CEO or a head of sales or a head of marketing to understand, you know, are we doing what we can to engender loyalty with our customers and are we doing it in the right way? And creating an effortless experience, I think, is critical to that. Right. And that's where the expansion comes from and the cross-sell, the ability to go back into an existing customer base. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Who, who wrote the Challenger Sale? Was that Brent <clears throat> Brent Adamson? Brent, Brent Adams and and um, uh, Matt Dixon. And boy, um, Nick is going to he's gonna kill me because I've forgotten his last name. <laughs> Uh, Nick Toman. Um, no. oh, and, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, those those are the guys that wrote Challenger, and then Matt and Nick uh, wrote Effortless Customer uh, Experience with uh, Rick Delisi. I forgot uh, Brian was there. Actually, Richard, did you forget too? Suddenly that voice came in, and I was like, "Who's that? <laughs> who's, 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 who's who Brian? the hell? Who the hell who is the, that guy? Who the hell is that guy? He just shows <laughs> up suddenly. The security in this place is impeccable, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I got I got one. Yeah. curveball question too jim if you don't mind go, go ahead so, so when you Richard just showed my, up to the podcast so yeah you know I, I i just came out of left field yeah but uh richard when it comes to like if you could do anything and be guaranteed success no matter what it is what would you do and and why 
Uh, start a charter fishing boat uh, business um, somewhere in the Bahamas? No, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Well, like, you're an outdoors, like, you're an outdoor guy. guy, so yeah, I'm an outdoor guy, and and um, you know, I'm spending the week in Boulder for to celebrate a, a friend's 60th birthday this weekend. But I, I came here because I wanted to get some time outdoors. I did a, a hike early this morning in a mountain, just just uh, a few blocks from where I'm staying. I, I really enjoy fishing. I enjoy hiking, boating, um, anything outdoors is is um, sort of music to my ears, as, as it were. Um, what would I do? You know, I was guaranteed success. You know, for a long time, Jim, to be honest, I wanted to start a barbecue restaurant. Really? Because I'm from Texas, right? Yeah, and I yeah, lived yeah. In Austin, what I believe to be the sort of barbecue capital of the world. Yeah, I think yeah. people in in Tennessee and Kansas City and, and North Carolina might disagree with me, but um, uh, for a long time, I really wanted to start a barbecue business, and and um, so that uh, that's still sort of percolating in 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 the back of my head, but I don't know that I'll ever do it. Well, you'd want to be guaranteed success if you did, right? So right, yeah, there you exactly go, right. definitely. Hey, yeah. that's Richard Perez of Apex Partners. Uh, remember, um, the website is apex.com, A-P-A-X.com. Richard, I want to thank you very much for joining us on this podcast. You are filled with great information, and um, we want to thank you for joining us today. No problem. Enjoyed it, Jim. Thank you both. And I want to say thank you to Brian, uh, who just showed up, as you know, here uh, suddenly. Yeah, you're he, welcome. Here, yeah, thank you, Brian. He's there. <laughs> Brian I'll be here all week. <laughs> yeah. Brian Anderson is our uh, content manager. He edits and uh, produces the podcast. I want to thank uh, Sam Ward for the intro, outro, and the music, and all of the subscribers out there. You can find this podcast uh, wherever podcasts are found. I don't, where, Brian, where are they found? I don't, I don't know. Literally everywhere. The Spotify, internet. Apple yeah. Podcasts, oh. Google. Yeah. You can oh. Everywhere and anywhere. Uh, okay. My um, reach is uncontrollable everywhere. at this point. Yeah. That's oh, awesome. Well, hey, again, thank you, Richard, and uh, all the best in your endeavors that you're going through, because uh, we love working with you, and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks, folks. Uh, remember, uh, this is the Growth Enabling Madness podcast, because we're mad about growth and scale. This is Jim Ward. I'm CEO of Brain Cell. See you later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Growth Enablement Madness podcast. I also want to thank Divinio Podcast for this episode's production and distribution. Finally, thank you to Sam Ward for our musical introduction and outro. Be sure to check out all of our episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. New episodes are available monthly and cover all important topics for growing and scaling your business. Until next time, this is Jim Ward signing off. Let's grow. Let's grow.